Thank you. Welcome, everyone. My name is Martin, and I work as a software developer at a company called Atlassian. So let me start with a question. How many people here know what Atlassian does? OK, that's most of you. So you probably know that we are famous for things like Jira, Confluence, Trello, and Bitbucket. But there's one more thing that we are quite known for. So if I open my browser and I type kotlinlang.org, a page will load. I will go down to Kotlin usage highlights, and there we are. So we are also known for using Kotlin. And what it says here is that all new code in the Trello Android app is written in Kotlin. So you might know Trello. It's a collaboration tool to organize any kinds of projects, ports, lists, and cards. And this is the Trello Android app. And that is a true Kotlin pioneer. Because the first commit that was made into this app was in October 2016. And that was Kotlin version 1.0.4, before it was endorsed by Google. And today, it's not just Trello. We have other apps like Jira for cloud and server, Confluence for cloud and server, and OpsGenie, and they all use Kotlin. But it's not just mobile nowadays. More and more backend services are written in Kotlin. So let's focus on Jira software. After all, this talk is called Future of Jira Software Powered by Kotlin. So what is Jira software? Encyclopedia definition is that it's a tool to plan, track, and release software. But let me ask you, how many of you actually use Jira at work? OK, maybe half. So Jira is a simple issue tracking system. And Jira software adds the agile tools on top of it, like boards, sprints, reports. But you probably don't want to know that. You probably want to know what is Jira software from the developer's perspective. And for that, I have to make a little trip into the past. So Jira was released 17 years ago in 2002 as an on-premises product, a simple Java app that you can run yourself in your app server or servlet container. And the first cloud version was exactly the same. It used the same single code base with the server it was just deployed in our data center. You can imagine that was not very scalable because for every customer, we actually deployed this application into a new Linux server. And also, the requirements for server apps and cloud apps are a little bit different. So in 2016, we have decided to fork the code. Now, that left us with a big monolith. So that was Jira, and Jira software was part of it. And it was all written in Java with a little bit of Scala. And there were Jira developers working with Jira software developers on the same code base. And the code base grew, and the number of developers increased, and the happiness decreased. And the more it grew, the worse it was. And if we didn't stop there, something like this would happen. So we didn't want that, so instead, we looked at the code base, and we saw some pieces that not necessarily have to live in the monolith. And that's where we started a process of decomposition. We took this big monolith, and we extracted a service. And then we extracted another service, and another service, and surprisingly, some of these services are written in Kotlin. And that actually makes our developers happy again. So how does Atlassian build services? To accelerate this whole process, we have created a platform to help our developers to build, deploy, and run services. We call this platform Micros. So Micros is a platform as a service that allows me as a developer to create some code, put it in a Docker container, create a little descriptor, and this platform as a service will deploy and deploy everything for me and give me the resources I want 
in AWS. It's no magic, as I said. It's just a selected tech stack and a lot of automation. We wrap the service in a Docker container, and then the platform will take it into AWS, provision my resources, and one important step, it will give me some extra monitoring on my service. Because that's what we believe in. We believe in you build it, you run it. So most of our team are working as DevOps teams. They have to not just write the services and hand it over to some support person who's a poor guy who has to maintain it. We actually have to maintain it ourselves. So my service goes into the Docker container and then I need this little descriptor. It's really simple. I just need a name for my service. I need to tell Micros which ports I'm gonna expose to the internet. And then I need to give Micros my health check so it can check if my service is running. And also I'm gonna ask for, in this case, DynamoDB. All right, so what goes inside the Docker container, right? Because Docker container can run any kind of technologies. But what did we decide to put in? Atlassian teams are autonomous. We can choose our tech stacks. Even though we are a big company, they still give us this autonomy. Now, a tech stack is a set of preferences, but once we agree on it, we use it for all our production services. Fortunately, these tech stacks can evolve over time. And what happened recently is that Kotlin got into the tech stack. So now the Jira software tech stack says, use Kotlin for all new services. And I think that's, that's, that's quite a big deal. We also use Spring Boot because we are used to it from, uh, from the Java apps. We use DynamoDB or Postgres. And also we use Project Reactor if we need to write asynchronous services. Okay. So, powered by Kotlin, how did Kotlin get onto the stack? I'll give you five criteria that you can use to judge any new technology that you want to introduce into your tech stack, and this is exactly how we do it. So first, we had to look if we have enough developers working with Kotlin. Be because we are a big team, Kotlin had to be evaluated. We cannot just listen to a few developers who want Kotlin and then everybody will have to use it, everybody will have to know it. Fortunately, we already had mobile teams working with Kotlin and quite a few backend developers actually knew it. Then we looked at our experience with Kotlin because we wanted to avoid another Scala situation because we introduced Scala into one of our plugins and it was not very successful because now nobody knows Scala and nobody wants to work with Scala anymore. Another thing, we had a lot of internal libraries and yet they were written in Java. So we had to ask ourselves, is Kotlin gonna play nice with these libraries? And as you all know, interoperability with Java is one of its strong points. Next, we had to look at the industry. Is Kotlin already established in the developers community? And since you are all here, we know it is. It's a de facto standard in Android development and it's supported by Spring and JetBrains who made Kotlin also make IntelliJ. So that's, that's the answer. And last and probably the most interest, uh, interesting and important is does Kotlin actually make our developers more productive. Well, we did a lot of research on that and we found out that we can hire a Java developer and turn them into a Kotlin developer in just one week. And uh, anecdotal experience is that the teams that use Kotlin actually feel more productive. So I'm not afraid to say that Atlassians love Kotlin. And it's already showing in our job advertisements because now we are looking people who are experienced with Kotlin, have interest in Kotlin, and we put our tech stack in our job ads and it says Kotlin. Okay, now I would like to show you a, a real app 
that we have built recently. Imagine a front-end app that we actually wrote in, in React.js that is hitting uh, different endpoints or different services. So some of these calls can happen in parallel, but some of them cannot because they depend on each other. So you have to make, let's say, three calls. And there is latency on top of the actual processing of the service, and you cannot do much about it because that's simply the distance between your computer and the data center. But you can still do something, and that's, that's what we did. We introduced a gateway inside the data center. So you still have to call the gateway once into the data center, and that's still the same latency. But these three calls inside the data center are very, very quick. OK, so for this app, we chose reactive streams, and we chose the project reactor implementation of reactive streams. Why? Because we needed an asynchronous processing. Our service is calling other services, then waits and does mostly nothing. So asynchronous is a perfect fit. Of course, Project Reactor and Reactive Streams are not the only solution. We could have chosen, for example, Completable Futures or maybe Coroutines. But another reason why we chose Project Reactor was that it gives us a very powerful set of operators that help us to modify streams and combine streams together. And it also produces clean code with no callback hell, the kind of clean code that we like. But if you've been to the first presentation today where Svetlana was showing the, the flow, the, the coroutines flow, that's actually what we like. So maybe next time when we're going to be deciding what we're going to use, we might go with the coroutines because of that flow. OK, so I'm just going to quickly introduce a few concepts from Project Reactor or Reactive Streams. So this is a mono. A mono is a stream of zero to one items. And in Kotlin, if you have Project Reactor, you can turn anything into a mono using this extension function. Another important thing is a flux, which is a stream of zero to n items. And again, see how I can turn any collection iterable or stream into a flux. And one more thing, we call these monos and fluxes publishers. Let's take a simple use case for these two things. We want to print the latest three users logged in. So I have the current user, which is me, I just logged in, and I have a list of four recent users, and I just have their IDs. So the code that would print first names of the three recently logged users in Project Reactor would look something like this. I'm going to take current user, concatenate it with another stream, which is the recent users, and that creates a new publisher. Then I'm going to map those IDs into first names using my little service here. I'm going to take three elements, and then I'm going to subscribe to it and print them. So the important thing here is that the service is only going to be called three times because th I only want three items from the stream. And it only executes when I actually call subscribe. So I can take this without the subscribe. I can pass it to somebody else, and it's not going to execute. It's going to execute only when the subscriber wants it to execute. And of course, this, this is how it looks like. Now, I was talking about manipulating the streams. So let's say my user service is not very reliable, and sometimes it takes long to translate the user ID into the name. But this is not a critical functionality, and I think it's better to print something than nothing. So I'm going to put a timeout there. If my service is taking too long, I'm just going to print recent user, because it's not critical. And this is how simple it is in the reactive streams. Just add one line for a timeout, and then you add one line, which is the handler that prints something else when there is an error. And the error is a timeout. And this is what it's going to look like if it times out on the first user in the recent users list. All right. Reactor is not without its coaches. So how many people here have ever used a thread local variable? 
two. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to quickly introduce what that is. Uh, let's say you have a blocking processing. You have, you have a service that for each request, it uses a single thread. Okay, you can put anything into a thread local variable and you can be sure that it's going to stay there during the whole processing and you can be sure that the other thread that's handling another request doesn't have the same value, has its own value. So it's, it's quite useful because you can put stuff like, I don't know, user authentication or other things in it and it's going to live with the whole processing. But in Project Reactor, that's not possible because there's no guarantee that your stream is going to be executed on the same thread. So there's something else that Project Reactor has, fortunately, which is a subscriber context. It works almost exactly the same. But instead of having a variable on a thread, you have a context where you can put anything on the whole stream. Now this will be important later, but this is the end of my little introduction to, to Reactor. Now the next thing we wanted is to have a really nice API for the front end to consume. And we chose GraphQL. There was already a presentation uh, before about GraphQL. Unfortunately, I didn't see it because it was only in Japanese. But if you've seen it, this might feel a little bit familiar. So GraphQL is a schema language and it's strongly typed. What it means is that uh, it's, it's safer, it requires less testing, and it doesn't get out of sync with documentation because the schema is the documentation. So for example, if you have a REST API and you document it in Swagger, you have to make sure that the REST API and the Swagger documentation are always in sync. And there's so many problems with it and there are so many solutions to it but GraphQL has just one. I'll give you the schema, and this is it. This is the documentation. It on also gives you exactly what you want. So you can query for things from multiple sources, and also you don't have to ask for everything. It's human readable and easily writable. And in the end, you get less requests and less traffic. So that was perfect fit for our Riddle um, gateway. And for people who know the front ends, we use, we use React.js and Redux Store, and there are very good mature web clients for GraphQL that allow you actually to drop part of it. The whole Redux Store is completely useless because there's a client like Apollo that caches, that has a caching mechanism that, now, I mean, you probably don't, um, don't know that. I'm, I'm, I might have uh, forgotten to ask how many people actually use um, front end like a re, uh, React JS or something like that. One, okay. <laughs> I might have better skipped this part. Okay, so back to GraphQL then. Um, GraphQL always start with, uh, with a query, okay, with this type query. And in my case, and this is very similar to what we actually do in JS software, there is only one object, and that's the board. So you ask for a board by ID. A board is an object that has an ID, a name, and a list of issues. An issue is an object that has an ID and a key. It's a very simplified version. Now, I want to be able to send a POST request to this, this URL, and this is a real URL. If you ever like spy on what we do in Jira, you're gonna see this. And I want to send this query. I'm gonna ask for a board ID 42, and I only want the name and issues, and I'm not interested in the IDs, and this is what I'm gonna get back. A data object that has the board and the issues. And in, in real life, the name and the issues actually come from two different places. So our whole solution is based on Project Reactor and GraphQL Java. We picked GraphQL Java implementation because it's an open source project maintained by Atlassians. So we have some leverage if we find some bugs in it but it was not without problems. So remember I was talking about subscriber context, where you can put useful information on the stream and then you can pick it up during the processing of the stream. Now GraphQL Java is not using Project Reactor, it's using completable futures, and there's no similar concept to it. So 
So fortunately, there is something similar called data fetching environment in GraphQL Java, but we actually had to hack it. So what we are now doing is like when, when the stream gets to GraphQL Java, we take the context, we put it inside the data fetching environment, which is not supposed to be used for that, and when GraphQL Java completes processing, we take it back from there. So I don't have the example here because it's quite complicated, but I have a simplified version in the example code that you will find at the end of the presentation. All right, so now take all this, because this was all theory and it was boring, and actually write our own GraphQL gateway. And it's gonna take us 15 minutes, and after those 15 minutes, we're gonna have executable code that is a real GraphQL gateway to a REST API. So I found this API, cat facts API, where you send a get request to this URL, that's a real URL, you can try that now, and it's gonna return a cat fact, like the leopard is the most widespread of all big cats, and its length, the length of the sentence. But then, I found another API, the dog facts API, and you send another get request at a real, a real address again, you can try, and it returns you something like, a dog's first sense to develop is touch. So, shall we have a vote? Cat facts or dog facts? No, I'm just joking, we're gonna use both, because that's the whole point of having a GraphQL API. So I want to have, I want to create animal facts GraphQL API, and I want to give user the option to send a request to this, this URL, this is not a real URL, so don't try, with a query asking for a dog fact and a cat fact, and get something like this in return. Okay, so I said I promised 15 minutes, so let's go. I'm gonna go to Spring Initializer, and I'm gonna create a Spring Boot project with Webflux. The first part that it's gonna create the, of the Gradle descriptor is not very interesting, it's just a simple Kotlin project. The only thing important is that it needs to have this Webflux dependency, and I'm gonna add just one thing, which is the GraphQL Java dependency, and there's also some other stuff that is, that is created by the Spring Initializer. So that's my dependencies. Now the entry point um, to the application looks like this. If you have used Spring Boot before, this is probably familiar, you know what I really like about Kotlin code? Is that it often fits on a single slide. You know, this is the whole file. This is gonna be my GraphQL schema. I only want the users to query for cat facts and dog facts. And the fact, again, is a very simple object that has just a fact and its length. All right, so how do we get these two things, the cat fact and the dog fact? The two fields will be populated by something we call fetchers. That's the term from GraphQL Java, probably from other GraphQL libraries as well. So a fetcher is an interface from GraphQL Java that you have to implement. Again, the great thing about Kotlin is that the data fetcher is a Java interface, but we don't really care because Kotlin is so good with these things. And the only thing we have to do is implement this get method that will return a future. Now I really like to write services and APIs using a schema first approach. So what schema first means, I'm gonna write my schema, like the GraphQL schema, or if you're writing REST API, the swagger, and then I'm implementing this in the code. And again, Kotlin allows me to do this very quickly using data classes, so each of these types in GraphQL schema, I can represent with a simple, simple Kotlin data class. So this is our fact here. And this is the cat facts fetcher. And this is again the whole code that I have, I have, I, I really don't need anything else. So it's a simple Spring component. Spring will give me a web client, which is a reactive web client. When the call to the service happens, I'm gonna convert the payload into a mono of the type cat fact, and then I'm gonna map it into my representation of a fact, and then convert this stream into a future. So there's this little little switch from the reactive streams into the futures. 
And again, a very, very simple data class that represents the payload of the CatFax API. Okay, dog facts fetcher looks very similar. You might have not even seen that I've changed slides. The only difference here is that the API doesn't give me the length, but I can simply calculate it in, the, in my stream processing. All right. This was, these were my fetchers. So you also have to do a little bit of configuration, but that's a little bit boring, so I'm gonna skip it. This is just reading the schema. This is the actual wiring. So wiring, we call the part when we take the GraphQL schema and we say, where are the fetchers? So the only interesting part here is that I'm saying that the dog facts fetcher will fetch my dog facts and the cat facts fetcher will fetch my cat facts. It's the end of the configuration. A simple service method, I just need to call the GraphQL. Again, the tricky part is that GraphQL, Java, futures, reactive streams, something else. So I execute async future and I get back a mono. And the last thing is I have to expose my GraphQL endpoint. Now, nowadays, when you use one of the Spring Boot starters from GraphQL, this is probably done for you, but I still like to do this myself just to show you that this part is there. So once I call my service to process the query, which GraphQL Java takes, uses the fetchers, fetches all the APIs, and then in this step, it takes the map of the object, it's just a simple string to any map, and it checks it against the specification. So if the resulting payload does not, does not fit, the, fit the GraphQL schema, it's gonna, make, it's gonna throw an error. And that's it, that's all the code that we needed to write the GraphQL, GraphQL gateway. And this is what's gonna be the result. So once somebody calls our API, we're gonna subscribe to the stream, call the two other APIs, and create this resulting object. So it's gonna be a simple JSON object with this data, dog fact, and a cat fact. Now, this service is already gonna work, but it's not very good yet. Why it's not very good? It's because it's not resilient. So let's say the dog facts API takes about 250 milliseconds to complete. And the cat facts API takes about 300, 380 milliseconds. So in total, that means the processing is gonna take 380 milliseconds, thanks to the asynchronous nature that we call both APIs at the same time. What happens if the cat facts API is broken? I think my service will time out after something like 30 seconds, because that's, that's the default hard-coded somewhere. And then the whole thing will take 30 seconds. And the user will get something like this. A dog fact that he actually wanted, then a null cat fact that he cannot do anything with, and an error message that, yeah, sorry, the operation for cat timed out. Okay, so let's add a timeout. I personally believe that every call should have a timeout, and the timeout should be the most tolerable value, okay, the maximum tolerable time. So let's say five seconds the user can tolerate. Okay, that will make our service a little bit better. And this is how the code looks like. We just need to add this one line because I showed that before. You can, you can manipulate the streams, you can add timeouts. So let's say after five seconds, this should throw an error, okay? So this is how it's gonna look like uh, for the user. It will get, they will get the dog fact, there will be a null cat fact, and a message that we can of course change, saying something like, oh yeah, it timed out after five seconds. But can we do better if we already know that the cat facts API is broken? Turns out we sort of can if we introduce a circuit breaker. Now to explain a circuit breaker, I have to move to the other mic because I'll need both hands. So you can watch the slides, but you can also watch me. <laughs> so let's start with the cat API that is working. And you can imagine that we have a real electric circuit and the circuit is closed. So the signal can, can go through. Now the cat fax API just gets broken at some point. So we still try to call it 
but we get plenty of errors. And we say, let's say that if in 100 errors I get 50, if in 100 calls I get 50 errors, I'm gonna open my circuit and I'm not gonna allow to call the Catfax API anymore. And instead, I'm just gonna return to the user that the Catfax API is broken. But I'm gonna give him the doc facts very quickly. Oh, I think I'm missing a, an arrow. <laughs> Yeah, there it is, okay. Hmm. Ah, it disappeared, okay, I should have thought about that. Okay, so now I'm in the open state. Now, it wouldn't be very good if it stayed like this forever. So after some time that we also specify, we try to call the catfax API again, and this is called a half open state. I will allow, let's say, one or two calls, but the catfax API is still broken, so I keep my circuit open. Go back to the open state. But then, after some time, the Catfax API gets fixed. So, after my timeout is, is um, timing out again, and I go back to the half open state, I try to call the Catfax API, and it's working, so I'm gonna close my circuit, and go back to normal operation. So this is how a circuit breaker works. And, and this is how it looks in the code. I simply add a transformation of my stream, which is this, which is this circuit breaker operator of my cat breaker. And the cat breaker needs a little bit of setup, and that looks like this. But this usually you do just once, and you can also put it in something like application.yaml, and it's all configured, configured automatically. And the result that the user gets is something like this. A doc fact, a null cat fact, and a message that we can also change, but the default says something like my cat circuit breaker is open and does not permit further calls. But this is gonna take 250 milliseconds because that's how long it takes uh, to call the docfax API. The only issue is that we might actually miss some of the cat facts because while we are still in the open state and the catfax API can actually start working again. So you have to kind of think about, think about that. Now, this was a lot to take in, but we have actually built a resilient reactive GraphQL gateway. So because it's very late, and I don't expect you'll remember everything, but I really, really want everybody here to take away these three things from my presentation. Try using reactive streams for an application that waits a lot. If you have, for example, an IO heavy app like we do that calls other services and then sits and does nothing, try reactive streams or any other asynchronous processing, but reactive streams really work very well with this scenario. If you have a public facing API or an API that's used by front end, try using GraphQL because it actually makes really pretty APIs. I only showed you the query part, but there's also a mutation part. So if you create a GraphQL API, it's not just for reading. You can also use it for writing. That's very, I think it's not as well known as, as the querying part. And the last thing, whatever service you are making, if you are calling any other service, please add some resilience, because that's how you prevent errors propagating downstreams. Okay, so before we finish, and I'm not sure if I'll have time for questions because I don't have the, I don't have the speaker time outside. So before we go there, I'd like to address two points because every time I'm talking about Kotlin, somebody asks about coroutines because I didn't really mention them. So let's talk about alternatives. We haven't used coroutines because our project started in January 2018 when coroutines were still experimental, and we do not really use experimental in our code. But we might use them in the future. As I said, we have autonomy in what we are using. Kotlin is already on our tech stack. There is also a chance that somebody will implement Project Reactor using coroutines. It has been already talked about on the, in the Project Reactor's GitHub. One of the issues was open that, oh, let's rewrite this whole thing in coroutines. Another thing is that we picked GraphQL Java, but there are already 
Kotlin, pure Kotlin implementations, I, I believe at least one. But as I said, we have leverage in GraphQL Java because it's maintained by our colleagues. Now the last thing that I want to show is this little bonus slide that I've added recently. I actually found out that there is a coroutine support for Project Reactor. So I have changed the service interface, you know, that says process query. I changed it from a returning mono to returning just a map uh, of a string to any. And then this little part is a coroutine builder. So like launch or async, you can, you can create a coroutine that will execute the code inside and then it will return a mono. I find it quite amazing. And this unconfined means that it's gonna start in this thread, it's gonna be dispatched here, but it's not gonna be uh, confined to this thread when it's gonna run in the stream. All right. I also have a list of resources for you because this is the end of the presentation, but there was a lot of code, and if you would like to try it yourself, if you would like to go through it, I have an executable version of it. So this first resource is a little big bucket project, a, a project in with bucket that is executable, you can try. Uh, another link that I have here is the GraphQL Java project. Now for resilience, we use a library called resilience for j I think right now it's probably the best one. We switched from Hystrix into resilience for j maybe uh, two years ago. Now, I didn't speak about graphical, but I've added a link to it here. Graphical is a very useful tool for debugging your GraphQL and also for exposing your documentation to your users. It's something you can bundle to your project and it looks like a little IDE where you can write your GraphQL queries and it's gonna actually check them against the, the schema. And the last thing is the Coroutines Reactor project, which I found myself recently. Now, if you would like to know more about what I said in the beginning, that a Kotlin was um, first added into the Trello Android app really, really long time ago, please go to Trello Tech Blog. I've linked um, one of the articles about Kotlin. If you want to know more about how we build services, because we actually took the whole server Jira and we put it in the cloud and it was not an easy journey. So you can check this article in Atlassian Engineering Blog and there are also other articles. And if you want to know more about the platform as a service that we use, there's a slightly outdated but still very relevant video. And if you didn't get that picture with the girl saying why not both, just in case I linked the explanation here. Okay, so this is the end. Um, I have a few t-shirts here, so because I still have a few minutes, first four people who will ask me a question will get an Atlassian t-shirt. And if you want to get more Atlassian t-shirts like this one, we are hiring in Sydney, Australia, so please talk to me afterwards. We are also very well known for our beautiful t-shirts. Okay, so um, yeah, because I don't have the time afterwards, I have seven minutes, six minutes here. So if you want to ask questions, now is the time. And I have limited sizes. So there's one large size, two M sizes, and one very small one. Hi, uh, I want to ask why did you consider Project Reactor? Have you considered about uh, RxJava or are they different from RxJava? Right, so I think Project Reactor has more powerful set of operators than RxJava. It's very similar, but when we were deciding, Project Reactor had really the best set of operators. So the comparison there was mostly about the, the operators, I think. Three more t-shirts. It can be anything. あ、日本語でも大丈夫ですけど。はい。ああ。ありがとうございます。えっと、そうですね。えっと、GraphQL 
あのコトリンで書かれたやつをまだ使ってないのはなぜ,なぜですか I will reply in English. <laughs> so we don't use all those、uh, like、a Spring Boot starter projects, right? Because when we started, and we really wanted to use the Spring Boot web flux, there were no helpers for that. You actually had to write everything yourself. But once you write it once, you have no reason to use something else because it simply works. So, yes, you're right, there's so many tools now, like there's a Kickstart, Spring Boot Kickstarter for GraphQL, I think, and it does a lot of setup for you. But yeah, we didn't have that before, we wrote it ourselves. And then it's just there, it works, so we forget about it. Thank you for your presentation. As I understand what, what you said,、uh, the a t r a t i o n developers use s Kotlin for only for、uh, a t r a t i o n servers. Do, do, you, are you, do, do you have a plan to use Kotlin for.、Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you, 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 you developers use s Kotlin for. At Russian crowd?、Oh, yeah. yeah.、Uh, do you have a plan to use c o d e r i n for at Russian servers? Right, so you know our products very well. I honestly don't know because we are a really big organization and I work in the cloud part. So I, I think they, they can, like if they decide that Kotlin will help them, they can. So what we once tried, we actually tried, we asked ourselves, Can we introduce Kotlin into the actual Jira monolith, you know, the part that we are still decomposing? And the answer was、uh, maybe. So we didn't in the end. So maybe the server developers have several, similar dilemma, like they don't know if they can. Happy a r i a t o g o z a i m a s えっと、日本語で質問させてもらいます。えっと、ケーターとか、えっと、そういう別のウェブフレームワークとかは、えっと、検討したりしたんですか。So、in our tech stack, we use Spring Boot because that's what we are kind of familiar with, and a lot of developers are familiar with. But because Kotlin is already on our tech stack, it would be easy to say, yeah, you can use k a t e r as well, you can use Yeah, whatever. We can use coroutines, and they are not really part of Kotlin, right? You still have to bring another dependency. So, if we decide, let's say, let's say this. Okay, we have this、um, innovation part of our work, which we call ship it, when developers just for two days or one, 24 hours, they do whatever they want. You know, they implement whatever they want in whatever they want. So, maybe somebody will use it、uh, for one of the ship it projects. And they will say, yeah, hey, this is really easy and really good. And then the next time、um, when we decide what we're going to put in our tech stack, yeah, we say, oh, yeah, that was good, good experience. I like this code. The service made it into production in the end. So, yeah, why not? Let's introduce it. So, we can. We can. We don't because we don't have experience with it yet. Okay, we are out of time. So, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. And that's it from me.